climate startups that solve a meaningful problem in business or enterprise and that do so without a green premium. Yeah. So meaning like if you're choosing between option A and option B, not only do you get the same solution, but you get something that has a positive climate impact and it's at the same price or at a negative discount, that's gonna win. Yeah. Where I don't spend any time at any mind share is I'm not trying to influence people to pay 2X for stuff mm -hmm. that needs a green premium to be successful. Yeah. Because like I don't think in ultimately that's sustainable. And that was the mistake in Climate One because a majority of the companies were boosted by government subsidies and that's not sustainable. Yeah. So and, these yeah. businesses have to thrive on their own. Hey folks, welcome to another episode of Climb by VSC. I am so thrilled that you've decided to join us today. I'm really excited for this conversation because it's somebody that I have known for many years now. We're finally getting to sit down together in person. My guest today is Nate Williams, who's the founding partner of Union Labs, a pre-seed and seed stage firm that is investing in deep tech founders with visionary ideas. Your portfolio spans prop tech, mobility, climate, all topics that we love to cover on Climb. So I'm thrilled to have you. Nate, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Jay, this has been a long time coming. Yes. <laughs> a little homecoming for me being back in New York City. And I'm just so glad to be here supporting you and your fund and talking about things that we're so passionate about, which yeah. is back in the best entrepreneurs, yeah, the most and ambitious folks. You've been, uh, I think, so generous with all the insights that you've shared on your fundraises as we were doing our fund one raise. So uh, I'm happy to kind of have a, a reprise of some of those conversations <laughs> yeah. a couple of years later. Let me actually start with a, a little bit of your background. So you know, your bio proudly states that as a founding partner, you're a hands-on entrepreneur that knows how to finance, execute, and build. And I really dig on this idea of emerging manager as entrepreneur. It doesn't get talked about enough. The best entrepreneurs solve meaningful customer problems. Yep. What was the problem that you saw with Union Labs that you wanted to, to solve? Absolutely. You know, I think the keystone question of that, really great question. The keystone statement is like, every industry has to iterate. And so when we thought about, you know, constructing union, the, the, our thought was like, what's changing about venture capital? So I was EIR at Kleiner Perkins yeah. after running three successful startups. And so I had seen as an operator, the rise of these super angels, folks like Manu Kumar and Mike Maples, I didn't send et cetera. And so there was like this massive explosion of really amazing seed managers that replaced this sort of friends and family round. But those folks got bigger and bigger in terms of assets under management. So that was one catalyst. Catalyst number two is like, if we think of like, I, I operate in deep tech. Yep. And so deep tech now is synonymous with funds like Data Collective, Lux, Eclipse Ventures, Founders Fund. Yep. All those funds are over a billion dollar AUM. And so we saw this sort of maturing of the category and our you know job to be done was, we felt like entrepreneurs needed a partner at day zero mm -hmm. to help them do one of two things de-risk the product market fit of the company, which we'll talk about, I'm sure yeah. later. It's like, people think sales is like a bad idea. Sales, <laughs> like they hate talking about sales. I love sales. I'm yeah. an unabashed, love sales, former CRO, like let's talk sales. But the other is in product development for deep tech, there's always something that turns out to be a crux. Yeah. So we felt like we could create a union of the best series A VC firms. So Kleiner Perkins and GV support our first fund. Yep some of the best corporates. So we have a variety of corporate investors in our fund that help us see around corners. And lastly, it's about entrepreneurs. Yeah. We wanted to find like the most ambitious, most technical. So yeah, we got running in 2019. Our fund one is a 2020 vintage. Yeah. One of the most interesting things um, about you guys is that kind of incubate and co-found these companies along with being, you know, the traditional venture investor, lead investor. With so many founders out there, and really, you could find a founder building for you know any problem in these categories that you care about, climate, prop tech, mobility. How do you decide to build versus buy? Yeah, it's a super good question. And, and you know, Jay, everybody in the audience, if you come on with Jay, he's going to do his homework. He knows everything. <laughs> so I would say, like, we have two countervailing pipeline processes. Okay. Like, the first part of it is that we do deep thesis research to have a prepared mind. So an example would be, we spend a lot of time thinking about robotics for labor replacement, say like in food services, yep. not just sweet greens, but like behind, you know, back of the house or industrial, Cargill, Smithfield, Tyson, yep. et cetera. So that's like one, we have a prepared mind. And so when we see the right surfer on the right wave, we can back her company. Yeah. But the other part is we also wanna be a partner at day zero to some of these founders. 
And so with these incubated companies, we have something called founded at. So mm. out of 20 current investments in our fund, seven of those 20 were either founded by an EIR who worked with us. Yeah. We were there at day zero actually paying for the company to be incorporated, or it was an idea that Chris and I had and we sort of, you know, incepted a, a founder to work with us to say, hey, this company needs to be built. Yeah. And so you were an EIR before. So explain that role a little bit because we haven't had anybody on the show that's kind of talked about what an EIR does inside of a fund. Like, what does that mean exactly? Yeah, I would say um, there's probably going to be a case study of me as an EIR at Kleiner who went in to build a fund as opposed to build a company. Right. But a majority of EIRs are there. It's an entrepreneur or an executive in residence. They're there to take a break from operating to get inspiration for what comes next. Mm -hmm. So one of the hard things as an entrepreneur, because you're so in your lane, like I spent so much time in connected devices, what they call internet of things, I didn't have a purview that was wider. Mm -hmm. I wanted to kind of cleanse my plate and, and get inspired for what came next. Yeah. Being at a venture capital firm like Kleiner Perkins, they see health tech, enterprise SaaS, crypto, fintech. And I was able to open the aperture and get inspiration. I'm like, I know my lane. I know what I love. I'm totally humbled by folks like Mamoon Hamid and Ilya Fushman and Wen Shea, who know way more in their areas. So it allowed me to kind of double down. Got it. With our EIRs, generally what they are, they are successful entrepreneurs who've probably sold their last company and they're thinking about creating something new. Yep. But they have five or six ideas that they're working through and they want to rapidly iterate. And so one of the benefits we have because of all of our connectivity is to say, hey, this idea may be a little bit more likely to execute than idea B, or you say you're going to do, I'll give you an example, a smart ERV company. Okay. We saw three of those in like a one month period getting yeah. funded. And yeah. so as an entrepreneur, you just never know what's out there. Yeah. So that's where we help. And then obviously knowing if they work with us, that will be the first million or million and a half dollar check is a really good collaboration. Well, let's talk about that customer validation piece a little bit, because yeah. this was something that I find really interesting about your background. You kind of said it at the top of our conversation, which is for a lot of technical founders, sales is a dirty word, right? And it, and it shouldn't be because part of sales is customer discovery. Part of that customer discovery is understanding, are you actually solving a problem or is this just like cool tech that you possibly want to work on? Talk me through that process. Like, How do you and Chris do customer discovery on behalf of the companies that you're evaluating for investment? How do you help your EIRs do that customer discovery? How do you validate that this is a problem worth solving? Yeah. First thing I would say is in deep tech, because of the heterogeneity, right? You're looking at space and you're looking at mining, you're looking at industrial hardware, you're looking at wood recycling. It's so wide. You can't be an expert in everything. So, you know, I'm from San Francisco, love to quote the warrior strength in numbers. Mm. You have to have a pretty wide crew that you hang with. And we're very lucky we're part of a group that's six major deep tech funds, yeah. G2 Venture Partners, Kleiner Perkins, Tyke Partners, Catapult, Matter Venture Partners. We meet twice a month. Yeah. And every Monday, five o'clock, twice a month. And basically we talk about hard tech deals. So whether it's silicon photonics or say, you know, robotic recycling, we can get to the crux. Yep. So I think that's part one is like, you really have to have a wide audience of other folks that can help you get to the right answers. Yep. The other part on customer validation is we have to get out there and actually talk to the decision makers of not only how they want to buy, but what their problems are. One of the things that I don't think we talk enough about as venture capitalists, especially in pre-seed and seed, is like, if you can't sell, there is no Series A. Yeah, This is a whole new market in 2023 mm -hmm. and will be for 2024. If you can't sell, it doesn't matter what you built you will not get to a series A. Yeah. So in you have to sell your, your co-founder, you have to sell your investor, you have to sell your first customer. And that's not like selling Zoom or Slack that's already well understood. It's like you're selling zero to one. Yeah. And so one of the things that we're trying to do when we talk to these entrepreneurs is understand their process of asking the right questions to get a company like a Schneider or a Verizon or a Comcast to do a trial. Yeah. But more importantly in the trial, how can you get them to pay money? Yeah. Because I think you had asked me, we, you and I had a quick pre-call, you know, what about this sort of like death by a thousand cuts? Like, you know what I mean? Pilot purgatory. Yeah. The truth is anybody can do a pilot because there's very little sign off. Getting a commercial contract is harder. 
And the right founder knows how to discern that conversation and basically focus on who can be a revenable customer. The challenge that I tend to find, because we see quite a few of these companies in sure. our portfolio that, uh, or not in our portfolio, but that, that are pitching us for investment, they'll come in with a quarter million dollars of customer contract. And you go, wow, 250K ACV? Yeah. Turns out it's out of a pilot program, because these pilot programs are actually quite large. And they're on the order of tens or you know millions of dollars that folks are happy to try out new technologies. And it's hard enough to get into those programs and then to then break through to say, okay, I'm coming out of your innovation budget into your you know annual spend and there's a line item for me in that budget. How do you, what have you seen in terms of the successful companies that have like navigated that transition? What are they doing at that pilot phase to set themselves up for success? Yeah, yeah. I'll give you an example. We have an amazing company out of the MIT Media Lab called Butler. Mm -hmm. It's us as investors, E14, Founder Collective, race data from analog devices, they have a people sensing platform. Okay. So they have a non-camera based sensor system that allows their customers to actually see how many employees are in the office, in what rooms, how many people are coming through the turnstiles, et cetera. They can use that data to make actionable insights of how much space they need, maybe restructure conference rooms, et cetera. Yeah. And so their ability to generate revenue has been pretty prolific because I think they do a couple things well. Number one, they tune their product to the needs of their target market. So they work with commercial real estate players or large tenants. Yep. So if you're a large tech company or you're a commercial real estate player, this is applicable to you. There's two sort of on-ramps. Some folks want a full turnkey DIY, like become a customer, get sent the sensors, they set it up, they give you the dashboard insights. That's one customer profile. But another customer profile already has a facilities team and a tech team yep. that wants the building blocks. And so early on, the CEO Hong Hao realized, I need to satiate two of these customer demands. If they're very technically savvy, I can give them the building blocks and license it. If it's somebody that needs their hands held, I can do that. That was number one. Number two, they brought in a very good revenue executive who basically could build momentum. Mm -hmm. So basically started to say, if I have, let's just say hypothetically, like a Facebook, would a LinkedIn look good next? Because a lot of these are lookalikes. The sales motion's the same, the customer designs extend, the throwing motion. And so they started to do that in a modular way. And the sooner you can get your sales process into something more methodical, I think it elevates the conversation. So again, I know our audience is not only other VCs, but it's entrepreneurs. Yes. The sooner you as an entrepreneur can talk to an investor about if I get 100 top of funnel prospects, I will then get 10 customers. Yep. The average ACV of a customer is X. And if I stack that up, then my revenue will be this. Yeah, That's the type of conversation now that needs to happen as a Series A. The sooner you get that methodology in place, I think it helps everybody. Yeah, that, by the way, is, is one of the big things that we talk about with our, our founders too, because you know, given our experience with PR and storytelling yeah. and narrative building, we say, look, I'll fill your top of funnel. We'll get you That's right. in front of the right press that wants to cover you what are you going to do with those leads? Show me the success of what's already in the funnel so that, you know, if we do fill it with 100 for you as part of our value add, you can do something with it. I think the, the, the point you mentioned there about building a repeatable sales process gets overlooked often with technical founders. Yes. It's something that the technical founders, I believe, think is going to be a lot easier to do. The simple answer might be go hire somebody. But if you as a technical founder have never built the sales team and never actually sold to, to enterprise, you don't even know what to look for in the person you're going to hire. So as somebody who, is, who has yeah. been that person that's been yes. hired as a CRO, yes. what should this technical founder be asking or looking for in that first head of sales? I love, I, I love the question and I, I love the approach because, yeah. you know, obviously you and your partner at VSC, you focus on not only the marketing, the PR side, et cetera. It's so important. I would say I actually think for the past 10, 15 years, this sort of cult of technical founder has actually done a disservice to the startups and okay. the teams. How so? Because like this propagation, like for example, at Google, the only people that matter, you know, 10 years ago at Google are engineers. Like engineers are the only ones that matter. PMs kind of matter. But if you're finance, marketing, sales, you're just not even in the conversation. That may be good at Google where you're just printing money. But in the startup world, you're more likely to die from lack of sales lack of sales revenue than getting the product right. Yeah. And so what I find in the conversation is 
sometimes a very technical founder, not because they believe it in their heart, because they feel like through peer pressure, they're being told that they need to do founder-led growth or founder-led sales, that it's almost like enabling. Yeah. Like, I don't need a coach. I don't need a therapist. I don't need, you know, uh, you know, a trainer. I can do it myself. And the truth is, that's total bullshit. Yeah. Like, you guys can name check me on this. I will say on your podcast. That's just bullshit. Yeah. Like, that's the problem of taking, we'll talk about Twitter or LinkedIn advice. You can't fucking buttonhole advice to serve your own purpose. <laughs> so if you're a technical founder and you don't want to hire sales, you can't then use a Keith Rebois tweet to say, well, Keith said this. Yeah. Because every, every startup's different. So what I would say as it relates to hiring the salesperson, the truth is a founder needs to evangelize what the product can be. Hmm. But what a founder doesn't need to do Set up the meeting, sign an NDA, figure out the business model. Also, be the bad cop to negotiate the pricing. So what I j tend to say is there has to be somebody in the first 10 employees that has a business mindset to think about the needs of the actual customer, yeah. how to get the product to them. Is it SaaS? Is it one-time revenue? Like, do we have to do post-sale support? And then actually do that hand-holding. Yeah. Because that first you know, go to market hire is a force multiplier for the founder. It gives the founder leverage to spend more time on product. So here's a risk. And I would say this, you asked a great question. A risk I see is where they bring in the he or she who's a bona fide sales expert who drives the 911, who came from Slack, Box, Salesforce, et cetera, yeah. and they ring the cash register. Yeah. But the problem with startups is you're not on the highway. You're not on the Route 80. You're not even on the side road. You're not on the Hutchinson or we're in New York right now. Yeah. <laughs> like you're literally on a path or a dirt road. Yeah. So I think where we say for our founders would be a good spot is you need kind of a hybrid sales and BD leader because business development is sales opportunities that are 12 months out. Mm -hmm. It's partnerships. It's product development. It's discovery. Sales is selling the widget over and over. So I think the first hire has to be somebody who's comfortable with product, who's comfortable actually doing the first deal ever. We call it the reference deal. And then eventually when there's momentum, that person probably does cycle out and you bring in the person who has done, you know, 10 million in revenue to 100 million in revenue. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think that, that, that profile of first sales hire is hard to get right because I think as a founder, you know, you're you're attracted by logos. You're attracted by uh, you know the scale of success that somebody had at one of these firms, and it's nice to go to your investors and say, "Hey, we got the you know man or woman who was VP of sales yeah. at this unicorn company." But if they've only ever sold at unicorns, then they don't know how to do that zero to one. Like they had a person that made their sales presentation. They had a legal person that negotiated the contract. Yeah. They didn't do the modeling of the business model, et cetera. They probably weren't at the trade show booth handing out the beautiful VSC mugs, et cetera, right? And so some of the more basic things, like yeah. you had talked about marketing, I would love your opinion on this, is like, you know, you look at your organic funnel that you're out there just kind of, you know, ground and pound, and then you look at like MQLs, yeah. right? Yeah. So trying to to talk to a founder about, hey, if you do this amazing marketing PR campaign, you can have a bunch of MQLs that actually give you enough pipeline to hit your revenue target. Yeah, totally. And so I think I'd be curious. Yeah, I mean, what I'll, are you, what I'll are you seeing you. in terms of like founders leading yeah, into that? On, on the sort of marketing and, and sort of PR side, you know, it, it's a very similar problem, right? There are a lot of idea executives out there. And I think idea executives are great to have. And you need those folks sort of generating and saying, you know, how how are we growing the footprint of your business? Yeah. How are we evolving your positioning, your messaging, your awareness? All of that is wonderful. Then you need somebody with the fingers on the keyboard to actually go and put that plan into action. From a PR standpoint, you need somebody who's going to go pitch 50 journalists yes. on your topic in order to get you that exclusive at The Information or, yeah, yeah. or at CNBC. The idea executive may have those relationships, but they're probably not the best person to do the ground and pound. Yeah. And I think that's the, the missing thing here is as a technical founder, you are interviewing those idea executives, those relationship executives, and then you either have to have the budget to support them with kind of a, a junior hire. Yeah. Or you have to find that sort of full stack Swiss Army knife who's, you know, going to be at the trade shows, is, is going to be doing the 100 discovery calls to find somebody. If that's never something you've done, 
you probably need to lean on your investors who that's can right. help you do that. That's right. So I'm hoping that's something that you're doing with, yeah, with your company. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. You know, I, you and I had a you know quick chat before this. You know, I think the process of you, you just became a parent. My kids are, I have a, you know, eighth grader, sixth grader, third grader. It's a period, like I learned more about myself from being a parent. Yeah. I've learned more about myself as like an entrepreneur from running Union for the past five years. Mm -hmm. And so when we started Union, I believed because I had done, you know, 15 plus angel investments that a very hands-on approach, I'm your training partner, I'm your buddy, like let's, I don't tell you what to do, but I can help you be better yeah. is a good thing. I'm a big fan of Vinod Kosla, and he talks with a ton of conviction and an amazing track record that VCs most time don't help, they actually destroy value. Yeah. And so I've taken a more broader approach in the last year in terms of how I think of what our job is. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about it, there was uh, you know, a, someone on 20 Minute VC from Benchmark that said, our job is to basically help four to five major decisions per year. Mm -hmm. So if a startup is in business for 10 years before they go public, four to five a year, there's 40 or 50 key decisions. Who to hire, customer contract, what round to take, et cetera. If you have the right people around the table with operator experience or finance experience, if you can increase the probability of a good decision, 2%, 3%, over time that compounds yeah. dramatically. Yeah. And so what I would say, we just had one of our companies, Urban Sky, um, that you know raised Series A from Lara Hippo. Yep. Ashley Vance did a, an amazing thing for Bloomberg Television. We also had a TechCrunch article because we had somebody at Lara Hippo who was a former PR professional, she was so helpful to unlock. Yeah. So yeah. the founder would never have that sort of unlock skill, but this person had a cheat code and they had a great coverage. We just had a company in whole home electrification ensemble that Dan Primack wrote about in Axios. Mm -hmm. So again, one piece of PR can actually move the needle. It's not in my portfolio. I don't know if you've seen this company, Pano AI. Mm -hmm. It's in the wildfire detection. Okay. They did a deal with T-Mobile, and I'm on a call with Rogers Communication in Canada. They're like, our CEO saw this commercial in the really? States. We need to do a deal like this. Yeah. So I always- It, ma it makes right? a big difference. I think uh, folks don't give it enough credit. Uh, you know what I tend to find? Uh, this is an interesting uh, revelation that we kind of yeah. have. First-time founders don't give it enough credit. Second-time founders- actually tend to like overweight it and want it yeah. even sooner sometimes like we have to tell them like hey guys you're not you're not ready for it just yet i know you want it but you have to have a big product launch or, or, or something that folks want to talk about it's not just hey i raised four million from these great investors there's got to be a an interest to the audience of the journalist that's writing about it but first time founders they often say you know if i build it they will come and i think that the problem in this scenario often is there is just so much out there. I mean, funds, right? We, we, we can talk about it in the world that we know. Yeah. 800 new yeah. venture managers yeah. in you know, uh, 2021 and 2022. The number of startups at seed states that are getting funded, now it's been coming down over the last couple of sure. quarters, but the last two years, there was a frenzy. The number of journalists has stayed relatively the same. Yeah. Right? It's, there aren't, newsrooms aren't growing meaningfully to keep up with the number of startups. And so the attention span of these folks is that much more constrained. The barrier for what is interesting to their audience 100%. has gone that much higher. Yeah. So you have to find a way to be interesting to them. You have to find a way to know what they care about. And a lot of what I'm saying on the sort of PR side right now is the same thing in sales. Is the it's same a, thing, right? It's exactly yeah, because like the buyer, parallel. the buyer of the buyer of that news might be uh, you know, a Dan Primack. The yeah. buyer of the news could be somebody at CNBC, right? It could be John Ford. Sure. But that's the same that the buyer at, like, for a startup would be the Sam Schwartz at Comcast who yep. runs Strat Dev over there. Yep. So you still have to think what's in it for them. And then I think what I see with experienced founders regarding PR is they think very smartly about the publics. So, like, for example, they're like, I know being in the financial press isn't going to help me get more candidates to apply, but I know it's going to help with downstream investors yeah. and possibly customers. Yeah. But then I know if I do something that's featured in Hacker News, like a funding announcement that's that going to get my technical through, hire. Exactly, yeah. technical hire. And so I'll give you an example from my operator. Yeah. I was, you know, at August Smart Lock. It was backed by Cowboy and Bessmer and Mavron. I yeah. ran go-to-market, also had control of marketing. And we got 
amazing press. We won, we, we won all these awards. We were at Best of CS. We were in all the Apple stores. Chris Mims wrote about us at Wall Street Journal. Well, Jason Johnson, the CEO, is like, I want to do a billboard campaign on the 101 in San Francisco. <laughs> and I'm like, these costs make no sense. Yeah. Like, like it's one market. We're not, the sell through's not there, et cetera. And I'm like, I don't, as, as like somebody helping and running marketing, I don't, I don't buy it. Like, I don't want to spend my money that way. He's like, no, we got to do it. And I got overruled. And we put these billboards up in San Francisco all the way down to San Jose, you know, the August smart lock, et cetera. And it turned out we were, you know, raising follow on capital and he was right. It meant nothing to our sales, mm -hmm. nothing to our sales. But for investors, just them seeing yeah. it was top of mind. It's like, if they have billboards up, they must be doing great. And then it, right? So <laughs> Totally. It's, it's the same reason you see all those uh, giant biotech companies as you're driving from SFO up to SF. Yeah. They're all there. Oh, Mammoth Biosciences. Okay, yeah. they're up there with, exactly. you know, uh, Merck. Okay, they, they must be Paid doing something Paid for by right. AI. Like every, there was like C3 <laughs> AI, that every yeah, single yeah. billboard. You yeah. would think like, is this just endemic to san francisco or is it like in cleveland do they have ai billboards no i, yeah. I don't think i don't uh, think so because do. the investors aren't there I'll, I'll i'll tell you this uh you you mentioned something really interesting about founder profile and i i want to cover that sure. because uh i find it really interesting in this space of you know deep tech but then i think we're a little bit broader sort of in climate and, and industrial automation uh the profile of the kind of founder that starts this company our mutual friend lior susan from eclipse yeah, that's right was on the show a couple weeks ago and his whole thing was you know the profile of this founder isn't the the coder hoodie guy with the laptop and you know a, a bottle of Red Bull. Uh, it is the 38, 42 year old executive who has spent a decade or more in an industry that is coming to build something out of it. Does that sort of map to to the the makeup of the folks in your portfolio, or what do you look for? beyond the technical expertise from the founder yeah. in terms of uh, their background and their founder market fit. Yeah. I mean, first, shout out, Lior. Just guy is such a man, such a great guy, great guy. And I love what they built at Eclipse. Yeah. My, you know, my data supports what he's seeing. So when we look at Fund One, we have 20 investments we've made so far. About half those founders are either second time or third time founders. Yeah. So they've, you know, created a company before, either as part of the founding team or as a senior executive, and they're doing it again. So they come in with a little bit more seasoning. Um, and then the other half are, you know, folks who are super technical, very ambitious and early. One of our founders, Katya, founded her company, Strello Biotech, as a junior at Penn. Oh, wow. So I think it can come either way. With the more experienced founders, what you see is they like live the problem. Hmm. You know what I mean? They were in a problem space where they said, hey, I had responsibility at Cisco for this market segment and I saw a miss. And I tried to get them to build something and they said no. And then, right, that's I left sort to of, do it. Yeah. that's like the Zoom story, right? Yeah. But then there's other people who just, you know, they have a passion and they're younger founders and they're like, hey, I wanna make something happen in, you know, space or I wanna make something happen in climate. So I don't really think it matters to us what their background is, but something that I realized, this is no different than sports. This is no different than academics. It's like excellence matters. And so when we're screening a founder, we know that the business will most likely pivot. We know people from the team will most likely pivot, et cetera. But the one thing you can't change is their quest for excellence. And so I'm always trying to understand whether it's like, all right, were they an amazing athlete? Are they like a baker? Did they do something really hard in academia to get something published? Did they have a personal narrative where they moved to the country as an immigrant and you know overcame these hurdles? But I think you have to have signs of excellence mm -hmm. to do uh, excellent things in the future. Yeah. So we spend a lot of time trying to understand the psychology of the founder, understanding the market, and then saying like, this is a game, you know this, we talk about this a lot at our cool water operator, us and all of us other emerging managers. It's like, it's a game of power law. It's a game of outliers. Yeah. So we really have to step back and say, what could go right? Yeah. Like what something here could be so outrageous and so breakout that this company could be worth billions of dollars and a public company that stays around forever. Yeah. I think uh, David Frankel from Founder Collective says something yeah. to this effect, which is, don't invest for lack of weakness, invest for, you know, outlying strength and, and then fill in the, the weaknesses that you might see, you know, because those strengths have shadows, find, find people to kind of fill in those gaps. But if you're, if you're trying to de-risk somebody that has no weaknesses, 
understand that they may also not have something exceptional there. The reason I love your advice is because I think for founders that are listening, that is just as relevant for when they're hiring on their team. Yes. So the same thing that you are looking for for, for a, a founder you want to back in terms of that grit, that resilience, that that sort of outlying story of doing something exceptional, um, those first 10 hires That's right. set the culture for the rest of your firm. You want those people yeah. to be exceptional. You want, way. you know, again, we're using the sports metaphor, but it could be a variety of others. It's like, you want, we say this a lot, the best available athlete. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you're looking for a fullback or you're looking for a running back. You want, you know, you look at 40 speed, you're looking at combine, you're looking at all these things. We want athletes. So even in sales, you're not just doing sales if you're employee number eight. You're going to trade shows. You're doing marketing. You're probably doing, you know, social cre- media, creating like- a demo, <laughs> social media. You're also doing customer discovery and product dev. You realize that there's a customer opportunity. You have to develop a new API. So there's a lot there that I think is really important. And so that's part of this journey of a startup is making the right decisions. And the other part is along the way, giving them feedback that like, it's okay to make a mishire, yeah. right? On the investing side, I just want to double back because yeah, one of yeah, our yeah. friends, Kirby Winfield at Ascend, he said something recently on Twitter about his mental model, which is like in this market where although deal prices have started to come down, AI and others, they're still really hot yes. deals he is a default no to every deal for the rest of the year. Hmm. So he's basically like, I'm not writing any more checks. And so because he has that mental model, it's basically if he gets excited, then he has to break his own rule to do the deal. Now, I actually think that's a good way to think about it because one of the things that I would say from my personal experience, I'm glad I was an angel investor with my own capital, my wife's capital before we started Union because I did make some bets that were more incremental, Mm -hmm. meaning that I knew the entrepreneur, I knew the space, I understood where the unlocks were, and I'm like, I know that this could be successful. In worst case, it gets acquired by, you know, Motorola or Google or whatever. But that mindset doesn't return a fund, you know, 5X net DPI. So when you are in our leagues in venture, it's an outlaw, outlier, power law. I have to not only think that they can have an exit, I have to think that they can generate extraordinary value. And so those companies that I would like angel invest in, a couple of my early ones, it would be a a dead no right now. Yeah. So on that that topic, right, one of the interesting things about how companies in climate, how companies in deep tech raise maybe a little differently than the companies in SaaS, right? The, yeah. the SaaS companies kind of like clockwork every 18 months, they're yeah. coming back into market and hopefully they have the IRR or the ARR to back, excuse me. Um, but the companies that we're looking at, yeah, some are in hardware, not all of them, but they uh, have some kind of novel scientific breakthrough right. that needs to be explained, that needs to be validated. Does it make it harder as a fund manager when you're going out to market uh, where there isn't that sort of like, you know, clockwork step up of up rounds in the portfolio, maybe things take a little bit longer. Maybe there's some more sort of justification you have to do. What do, what are you hearing broadly from LPs as you have, you know, even your own LPs as yeah. you have these conversations about how like a deep tech fund raises its subsequent funds? Yeah, well, there's two, two questions there, one about startups and one about funds. Yeah. The short answer is yes. I like to give a short answer because <laughs> I'm verbose. Short answer is yes. I would say on the startups fundraising, one of the things that we try to work with our teams about is because deep tech is so, you know, there's so much heterogeneity, like every fundraising story is different. So one of the things that a founder can make a mistake on is trying to pretend that they're a SaaS company when there's so much more technical risk. Because when you get to the Series A milestone, if it's SaaS, you're basically just talking about, you know, ACV, TCV, ARR, stacking, cohort multiples, magic ratio, whatever du jour, but that discounts all the work you did de-risking the technical side. Yep. So most of the time where we make an investment at series C, we say, Hey, let's future state. It's 18 months or 24 months from now. You're raising a series A. What are the milestones from the technology side where you've ri- mitigated risk and show us that? And then what are the revenue milestones? And so that's what we're going to talk about when we get to series A. So I'll give you an example we have a wood recycling company called Mm -hmm. Urban Machine. Mm -hmm. So it's an amazing company out of Oakland. The CEO is the former head of innovation at Swinerton. It's us, Google Ventures, Chris Saka at Lower Carbon, and Catapult Ventures. We have a great team around it. 
basically in this case, they're gonna raise a series A. Well, in addition to their revenue profile, they are now on version three of their robot. Mm -hmm. So they have a robotic process that removes screws, nails, and staples from wood yeah. that's recycled, finger joins it back together, and then sells it to you know a construction firm. Yep. So when they're gonna raise their series A in Q1, number one is look at where we came from. We were in a small space in Oakland with one robot. Now we have version three of the robot that can do this. So that's number one. And the second is, here's where we said we would be on customer logos and revenue, and here's where we're at. Yeah. So I would say, like, you have to start with the right, like, future state. Because if you just focus on revenue, if you're deep tech, it discounts all the mitigation on tech. Totally. And, and the important part of, of, I feel like I quote Lior, like, every other yeah. week. One of the other interesting things is, like, the moat is that much stronger. That's right. And if you start to compare yourself like SaaS businesses, well, one of the things we know about SaaS businesses is they are a dime a dozen. For any one problem, there's probably 30 out there. There are not 30 robotic recycling for wood panel yeah. companies out there. Yeah. And so I think from that perspective as well, if you position yourself as a one of one, but you're able to build trust with your investors to say, uh, here's what we said we were going to do. Here's how we said we we're going to do it. We did it. And here are the outcomes. You you get to earn that that next round. You make a really good point, and like you can have five winners in SaaS and collaboration software. Yeah. In the deep tech side, it's normally winner take most or winner take all. But I would say if you look at the capital intensity, Nest, Ring, August, uh, you know Tesla, when when they get there, they get there. Yeah. So if you say like a business like Uber versus Lyft, how much investor dollars did they spend out marketing each other? Hundreds of with millions. negative. Per, you know, user economics. Yeah. So I, I tend to think that deep tech is better as a platform because if you get your winners and you back them, you can maintain ownership and a misnomer that people say, especially we're going to transition to the LP side. Yeah. I think LPs are starting to get more educated about deep tech as a sector because of Lux, because of Lear at Eclipse and Zach and Matt at Data Collective. But like, we always have to start our meetings by saying, number one, deep tech is not hardware. Number two, deep tech doesn't have to be capital intensive because there's so much off the shelf hardware now. Yeah, You can get sensors, you can get robots, you can get robotic arms, et cetera. So for the right problem, you can get to an IPO stage at the same amount of capital or slightly higher, but then you have this large intellectual property moat and you probably don't have a ton of competitors. Yeah. So I, I see that a lot. And we think, and I last thing I would say to your to your next question is I would be wary of any deep tech manager that's a generalist. Mm -hmm. Like meaning there is no spray and pray in deep tech. Yeah. I just don't think you can have a broad portfolio because each day I'm moving from wood recycling robot, food supply chain, you know, IoT company over to a stratospheric micro balloon company it's not the same as like 50 SaaS companies. Yeah. And so for that reason, I think there's a limit of how many investments you can make per fund. Yeah. On the on the robotics point, it, are there common pitfalls you see founders making uh, as they are kind of taking that first round of capital, as they're thinking about kind of longer term capital allocation? I, I, I tend to find that the valuation of that first round often sets the pace for how much dilution you're going to take yep. later on and, and really how much you're going to own of the business. But I mean, beyond just round structuring, are there other common pitfalls you see robotics founders making in those early days? Yeah, I would say first for the LPs listening, our average entry price is about $9 million see, post amazing. money valuation. Yeah. So we've been able to uh, have 20 deals we've led or co-led 12 out of the 20 average ownership north of 8%. So yeah. we've been able to get in you know, basically at, you know, reasonable prices. I would say I've been in San Francisco since 2005. And I would say endemic to every startup, one of the biggest mistakes that is ever made is over featuring the product across every category, really? health tech, deep tech, SaaS, fintech, just the nature of a founder and the nature of just humans is if I do this extra curl, I'm going to be more likable. If I raise a slightly bigger fund, I'm going to be more successful. If I add five features, and what I see the biggest mistake across all the startups I've seen, and I've probably at this point across Kleiner Perkins, Intel, my own fund, I've probably seen a couple thousand startups over-featured. Hmm. They, they can never get a shot at finding true MVP 
because they have so many fucking features that they threw against the wall, <laughs> right? They're yeah. at feature 14 and they're doing stand-ups on it, right? And meanwhile, then they're talking about feature 15 and you're like, you're never going to get signal. Yeah. And so we always try to talk about is one customer segment, one use case, and get them to pay for it. If they're willing to pay for it, you've got a beachhead. Yeah. So talking about other other aspects of bad advice, this is one of, I know, your favorite topics. We're, we're chronically on Twitter. I, I may tweet a little bit more yeah. than you do. Um, there's a lot of bad advice out there. Uh, there are a lot of talking heads. What is another really kind of common piece of bad advice that you see too many founders take? Um, and, and how do you sort of advise your portfolio away from that stuff? Yeah, I mean, I think the most important thing is just like having founders understand confirmation bias is like, you know you want to go left. So then you source the Twitter verse or the LinkedIn verse and you find the one tweet of the person that supports what you say you want to do. <laughs> so it's like, hey, uh, you know, I want to do our offsite in Zimbabwe. And here's this one investor from whatever VC firm that said you should always go out of country for offsites. Right. Mm. So I think like any advice that's one off where there's no context can be used to support a bullshit like approach. Yeah. But I would say one that I've focused on is like these default blanket like. I find that, oh, that everybody agrees now that every team should be all remote. Hmm. Like that's bullshit, right? Yeah. Because it depends. Like if it's a team that already has product market fit, maybe you can scale. But as somebody who's worked in, in hardware, like there is no way you can build a successful hardware company without hand-to-hand -hand collaboration yeah. between multi-discipline teams, like mechanical engineering, software engineering, product management, go to market, like you need to be there. Yeah. And it's the same blanket stuff where folks go, oh, what we've realized from, you know, climate 1.0 is that hardware is uninvestable. Yeah. You know, well, actually the folks at, you know, Third Sphere, Stonely yeah. and Sean oh, for have sure. built Look very successful portfolios investing in hardware. What they've done is they've structured their fund to meet the demands of their customer, which are these hardware founders. The blanket statements never make sense, but they they make, you know, folks feel good and they got a lot of likes and retweets. Yeah. Yeah, it, you know, look, us as emerging managers, VSC and Union, I think part of this too is like we're packaging ourselves as a product. Yeah. And we, in addition to our founders, we sell ourselves. So our founders are out raising from NEA or Lightspeed or Coastal Ventures. But you and I are, are this week, we're talking to a variety of limited partners. Sure. And there is this sort of pressure sometimes to check the box and say all these things like, we don't do hardware, we only focus on climate. Like, here are all these awesome logos of investors. But the truth is, like, that doesn't differentiate you. Yeah. And you know from being in the market, there are so many smart GPs who have funds, who have been successful, went to good schools, had exits. So it's really crowded. What I've But the reason people... Well, hold on. Yeah, I, yeah. I'll stop you there. Because yeah, sure. I think the reason we're doing that, and, and, and maybe uh, you and I may disagree on this, like, LPs are looking to bucket their, their founders. 100%. So they're looking in their portfolio and they're saying... Do I have an industrial automation fund? Okay, I don't. How many have I seen? I've seen six. Are these the best of the six that I've seen? Yes. Okay, then you're my industrial automation fund. And that's really valuable because especially these institutional LPs, when they come in, they don't come in just for one fund, right? Yeah. They're with you for the next yeah. three or four, yeah. provided that you keep doing a good job. So what every, all the emerging managers that we talk to, all the ones that are you know raising their funds now, we're probably going to be out in market at some point in the next year. That's right. Like, we have to figure out what bucket are we going to fit in and are we telling a differentiated story to these LPs? Yeah. Because ultimately, like, they have their own mental models and they're trying to slot you in. So they're looking at, well, you know, uh, Nate, I've done too many deep tech funds this year. Yeah. Then you have to say, well, I'm a climate I'm fund. I'm a climate fund. So you don't have enough climate. Or, <laughs> but we're, uh, we're playing the game, right? Like, <laughs> I, I, I have a... a so we have a, you know, a limited partner in the fund who's a fund of funds and this person, Patrick, Patrick said to us, you know, one of the things that I don't like are these slides that show who your co-investors are. Cause mm. I think people just optimize for brands. And I said, look, I'll be honest with you. I respectfully disagree because I have to talk to LPs and these LPs want to know that, you know, uh, NEA, GV, InQtel, Lara Hippo, et cetera, have invested. Yeah. And so, although I don't necessarily think I need to show the social proof, I know the world's not fair and and the slide stays in it stays yeah. in the deck. Yeah. And so I think the part of that is knowing yourself, something that I know now, again, we're in market now for our fund too. So what I can do better now, Chris and myself, than from fund one, is 
I can say in the first, like I just came from a LP meeting. I can basically say that we are a sector specialist. We're deep tech specialist who does a pre-seed seed strategy where we have a concentrated portfolio. Okay. If you want seed stage generalist and you want lots of shots on goals, there's a bunch of awesome funds like Charles Hudson and Precursor or others. Like I get the strategy, but that's not us. Yeah. And so I think what I've been able to do with Chris is like we're better of saying what we are. And it's okay if you don't want that, but it allows us to spend more time on the folks that are looking for climate X deep tech funds like us yeah. that have operator backgrounds and that do these things. And the incentives of those LPs matter as well, right? And that, that's sort of where I think there's always nuance that people don't understand. There are LPs that want co-invest. Yes. And so for us, right, oh, our, yeah. our fund one is going to have 36 investments, wow. right? And we typically are getting around 25 to 3% ownership okay. in those deals. What that allows us to do as a sort of a, a new fund in the market is yeah. we play nice in the sandbox, right? Yes. Yeah. Founders say, hey, I really want your PR storytelling value add. I can make room for you for your 250K check, and you can get the ownership that you want. Doesn't ruffle the feathers of the lead investor. In fact, if they see us do a good job, they've now they bring us you into subsequent an, yeah. deals, right? Why are LPs happy? I've got four or five that really took a chance on us and our fund one because they want my Series B co-invest. That makes a ton of and sense. And that's great. Now, will that strategy scale over time as we raise larger funds? To be seen, right? Yeah. But you build your, your kind of LP coalition based on the demand that you're filling for those LPs as well. They want somebody that offers what we have that's unique. They also want our co-invest. You may or may not be able to do that with your LPs. Your LPs are looking for something completely different from you. And I think that's the nuance there a little bit of like LPs as a behemoth is not one category either. And I, you know, it's so funny. I had a dinner last night with some of my undergrad classmates. And one of the things that we talked about is like how important peer groups are. So now that we're parents and our kids are in, you know, elementary school or junior high, you're really focused on like the quality of their friends. Like, mm. you know, do they have good conflict? Are they making the right decisions? But I would say that around, you know, being a manager, like part of this is like realizing at some point people are investing in you mm -hmm. and we work in the finance business. We're in a specialty finance investing in early stage companies as asset allocators. But when they look at you and your partner or they look at me and my partner, they're trying to understand, can I trust this person to make analytical decisions to respect the money and understand of how to return a fund? Yes. And what I'm seeing is, over time, I've learned this just as like a human with life experience is we don't help ourselves by not being who we are. And one of the things I respect about you, Jay, is like you live your life, like you got married, <laughs> had a great wedding, now you have an eight month old, right? You love the sports and talk. Like, I feel like we need to really make sure that people can be who they wanna be. Yes. And what I've found is every time in my career that I tried to tone down being more of an East Coaster out on the West Coast. The, the, the less F-bombs I dropped, the less, <laughs> you know, intense I was, you know, it actually worked against me. Yeah. And when I ended up leaving Kleiner Perkins to start Union, I just felt this relief that I could be, I could dress how I want to dress, talk how I want to dress, and people can choose to buy into that or not. Yeah. But I don't have to put on a front. Yeah. And that's so fucking healthy in your life. There's like, a value in authenticity and, and, I, I strongly believe this, and I appreciate that it's it's being seen. Uh, you you put out the energy that you want coming back, for right? Sure. And so for me, it's like, yeah, I'm going to live authentically. And if there are people that don't vibe with that, then they're not going to come here. You vibe with that, so you're sitting down with me and yeah, we're having for this conversation, sure. right? Yeah. So ultimately, like you kind of you kind of project, and I think it's the same thing with as a founder when you're raising. Um, if you project that out, you will find the investors that get your company and understand what you're trying to build. And you're not one size fits all. You're not gonna pitch every investor. And the founders that kind of blanket email 300 investors without any kind of specialization yeah. are the ones that are less successful. Love than the, the work you're doing at Union Labs. And you're like, <laughs> what, what specific work do you like? Uh, I was talking to an investor friend who said Union Labs is an awesome, you're yeah, like, yeah, yeah. that stuff doesn't or work. Or you pick six funds that you know specifically focus and care about what you're doing build a relationship with them over six months, show them That's right. why you're going to be able to be successful at what you're building, and then that becomes a decade-long relationship. And that's the thing that I remind, this was uh, more reminders I had to make in 2021 and less now, but in 2021, these shotgun marriages at seed. Oh yeah. Right? These these billion dollar funds one writing fun, two million one dollar deal, checks. Yeah, one one yeah. meeting term sheet by the end of totally. the week. Totally. 
And I had to tell people that you're going to be in this relationship with this investor longer than the average American marriage. Like you need to know this person. And that's not just the brand or logo that they're at, because sometimes those partners leave. You have to understand how are they as a partner on your cap table. Yeah. Get to know them because when it comes time for your series A, when it comes time for your series B, they need to go to the mat for you with whoever else, uh, you know, is going to come into this, this board of yours or this company of yours or this cap table. If you don't know them well enough or they don't know you well enough to go That's ahead right. and do that for you, that is a terrible signal to the next round's founder, uh, the next round's investor. It, 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 it's such good commentary. Yeah. And I think this idea of craftfully building a fund really makes sense. Something that I would share, you know, as a fellow operator and as a friend, we have this internal document called the Union Way which we spent you know, a year working on, but it's basically like the ethos of our firm. How do we wanna be seen by our co-founders, by our co-investors, by you know, our LPs? And basically we have a priority of who those stakeholders are. We have a way we wanna deal with them. And we have this sort of, that venture's about paradoxes. Like we need to win every day at Union, but we also realize venture's not a startup. Yeah. This is a very long game. Yeah. Like we have to think years from now, and so that changes your behavior. So an example would be when we're talking to a founder, we consider ourselves to be founder fair. Founder friendly, I think, is a bullshit term. That's like, <laughs> hey, you're going to get the trophy or the fourth place flag football team. Fuck it. You don't get a trophy. <laughs> but uh, founder fair is, you know, is being fair to them and, and being an advocate. And one of the things about being an advocate is get, keeping it real, like telling them the truth. But obviously that takes time and trust. And so one of the things that we try to do is, I've learned in venture and my partner, Chris learned, he was surprised. He's like, holy shit, there's the board meeting. Then there's the pre-board meeting with, with the investors. Yes. Then there's a the post board meeting text thread and the messaging sometimes on the text thread doesn't match the board meeting. And I said, Hey, it's important that we can all get on the same page. If we say something that is constructive about a founding team outside of that meeting, we have an obligation to talk to them Yes, in a fair way. Like, Hey, we thought you could have handled this better. Or we think that you're, you know, you're not spending enough time on sales. We're doing a demo every fucking board meeting. So I think part of this over time is like how I want to be viewed on my worst day as a VC yeah. is, you know, Nate went to bat for me. He was a fucking OG. He really was an advocate. And in addition to being a good investor, he helped me be a better person. Can you can we say I know we're running a little bit long, but yeah. can we say more about this this board meeting piece? Because I feel like a lot of seed stage founders don't actually structure their board meetings the right way. And, and just from hearing what you've said, I feel like you guys have a really good handle on it. The board meeting isn't where you're surprising your board with information. Like they're, what I have seen the best founders do is actually have one-on-one -on -one conversations with the board before we come to the board meeting. And the board meeting is for decisions that need to be made, not to update you on the business. Is that how you guys run it? Yeah. Or, or what, what's the process by yeah. which you're able to like accomplish that? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we were talking sports, like I, you know, I'm thinking of the Bill Walsh score takes care of itself. Mm -hmm. So what we say to our founders is we're going to go at the speed that you feel comfortable, but like we should use from C to A as a way for you to get ready. And we should start to mature these board meetings. So when you have the series A, you're already doing it. Yeah. You have an agenda in advance. You send out the deck 48 hours before you solicit questions. And we're using that to take decisions at the board meeting but also maybe to workshop some ideas, go left, go right, hire this person, et cetera. Yeah. If we're using the meeting and basically you're just using like a Google sheet with topics and you don't have the financials, it's like we can't have a productive conversation. Yeah. And so I think part of that is just us, you know, saying here's what we're seeing. And this is the thing important for founders that are listening. Yeah. VCs aren't good at everything for sure. But one of the things that you could use us for is like, we see so many deals a year. Yep. You see so many deals here. Yep. We know what a good pitch deck looks like. 100%. We, we actually, because we have more portfolios, when I was an operator founder, how many times do you fundraise? You fundraise every 18 months. So if I did three startups, I probably went through you know 15 fundraising events. I've gone through at least 50 so far yeah. at Union. Yeah. So we're always in market. Yeah. So in terms of who to talk to, how to run the process, there's that. Yeah. So I think it's like, when do you lean on you know, your investors? Hiring, firing executives, fundraising, company strategy, et cetera. Like what to build on a product, 
I would, yeah. That's that's not for us to apply. Don't ask the investor <laughs> who was formerly at Cisco in the year 2006 to tell you how to build your cybersecurity product. Yeah, 100%. And I, I just underscore why you need as a founder a lead investor like Nate who understands that because they know what they're good at and they trust you to be good at what you're, you're exceptional at what you're at. And uh, if you find an investor that is trying to do your job for you, you know, time to run the other I, way. So this is, you're, you're getting a lot of personal stuff out of me, but it, I came to a conclusion. I was really bummed as a, when I was the Kleiner EIR that I never was a founder CEO mm -hmm. because I felt like that was important to basically have the startup that I was the CEO, but I was a three-time CXO, CRO, CMO, COO. And what I realized, actually, that makes me a better VC because I always had an upward manager influence a CEO. So I could say, hey, if we go right, this is what's possible. But if we go left, here's the consequence. And so I could avail the possibilities without telling them what to do. Yes. And now as a venture capitalist, I have that same approach where yeah. it's like if I was an investor in your company, I would say, Jay, you know, you're thinking of hiring her. I'm not so sure that you need this CMO right now. Maybe you downscale and hire a director of marketing and maybe you get two for one, yep. a director of comms, et cetera. But I'm an audience of one and of one, make your decision. And I think that's helped me. Yeah. And so part of this is really being the GP that you can be. And one last thing I would just say as we wrap up is I tend to find whether it's you, whether it's Peter from Stellation, you mentioned Shana from right supply, yeah, supply chain, chain yeah. or our friends at Hannah Gray, yep. right? I love Jessica and Kate. I tend to gravitate towards people who want to build an amazing firm, but also want to make venture a better, more inclusive place. Yes. And so if you ask me where I see myself in 10 years, in addition to union being on fund four, fund five, I want to be in the leadership conversation about where venture's going. Yeah. You see Charles Hudson now on the NVCA. I think that's inspiring yeah. because there's now been a turning the page of newer leadership. And I feel like people like you, me, Jessica, Shana, that's how you serve the industry yeah. is by elevating the conversation. So that that's my hope. 100%. That we right. have a lot of fun along the way, obviously some ups and downs, but we'll make it. You know, one of the things I hear from a lot of LPs is 2021 was an aberration. And there were 800 plus funds raised between 2021 and 2022. A lot of those managers are now coming out potentially to raise yeah. that next fund, that fund two, that fund three. You know, what are you hearing uh, from LPs in terms of how they view that 2020, 2021 vintage? Um, and what are LPs looking to see from those managers now that they're coming out for those second funds? Yeah, it's really interesting. You know, we have kind of a lot of things happening in the actual public financial markets in terms of companies going IPO, just overall interest rate environment. So this is not a time where LPs are getting a ton of distributions and a lot of liquidity. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of conservatism. That being said, I don't think we're helped by a, you know a lot of press that we're seeing. The story du jour is just how terrible it is for funds right now yeah. and how it's a flight to quality, et cetera. I'm taking a contrarian bet, which is if we really think about it, venture and private equity as a percentage of the global financial market is quite small. And I think over time, it's going to continue to build. So that's number one. Number two, when it's easy to raise funds, it's hard to deploy them because the startups are so expensive. Yes. And so I would be honest, I think we're heading into, uh, you know, another rough 12, 24 months for sure. Um, we are seeing great price deals and it's a little bit harder to raise. Now, that being said, prior in 2020, 2021, there were people who ran angelist syndicates. Everybody gets a fund. Everybody gets a trophy. <laughs> and I'm not sure. Again, I want to be careful not to disrespect other managers, but I think there were some people who didn't understand it's 10 years per fund plus two one year extensions. It's a long game. It's a long business. Yeah. And they said, hey, I'm going to dial this up. And now some of those folks might go back to Google. So I actually think some of that separation is good for us relative to the marks, because at the end of the day, venture is about your metrics. Yeah, I actually think we're going to be quite muted for another 12 to 24 months. But remember, because some of the largest companies have started to disinvest in R&D, 
when the market starts to uptick, they go on an M&A spree. Yep. They underinvested yep. in companies and development of AI. And now all of a sudden with their stock trading up, they go buying. So we're thinking union about continuing to deploy capital as a reasonable pace, make sure that our current port coast get to the next financing round. And relative to our conversations with LPs, we are, you know, in market for a $50 million fund too. We're not doing a massive step up in AUM. Yep. So we're not chasing that goal. Yep. So I think staying fair and balanced on fund size is what the LPs want to see mm -hmm. and a path of how you're going to spend it. Yeah. So our fund is a 2020 vintage. So we've deployed over three and a half years. Yep. And we'll basically, our next fund will deploy over three to four years. So we've got good dollar cost averaging. Totally. So for folks in the audience, it's not as bad as you think. Like, you know, be careful with how much press you consume. At the end of the day, if you love venture and you want to be in this business, you got to be in the good times and the bad times. And so stay the course, focus on the fundamentals, right? The throwing, the catching, the fielding, all that. And over time, right, you'll find the LPs to back you in your fund and things will go. Yeah. And I think for, for the LPs that are listening, you know, what I'm hearing from our LPs, from other ones that we talk to, is they're looking for folks who are putting the partner in limited partner. They have transparency. They have honesty. They're reflecting on, hey, here's what was happening in 2021. If we made some overpriced investments, here's what we learned from them. Here is how we're adapting that, that fund two or that fund three subsequent model based on the learnings from that time. Uh, and ultimately, if you're going to come in there and make excuses for you know the, the deals that you did at that time or the pacing that was way off and you you deployed way faster than you planned to, then I think the LPs are not going to trust you as a serious That's right. person That's who right. they want to back for, for subsequent funds. But if you come in there with saying, look, I'm in this for the long haul. I'm building a franchise that's going to get to fund five, fund six. So this is a small you know, blip in the road on the way to a much larger uh, uh, franchise. I'm finding LPs be much more respectful of that, responsive to that, and ultimately treat you like an adult as opposed to a, you know, I had a slush fund and I YOLO'd into 100 yeah. deals and, uh, yeah. and I'm making excuses for them. And so that's, I think, the, the, the big lesson for me. Again, we're not fundraising right now. The big lesson for me as I'm just having these, you know, coffee chats with LPs is yeah, just they are looking at their 2021 managers and they're, they're looking favorably upon the ones that are owning up to the, yeah, the yeah, mistakes. Hey, it was know? expensive and we probably deployed too fast, et cetera. It, longer term, it doesn't make sense to not be intellectually honest. And I think over time, especially for institutional investors who default invest, you know, they commit to one fund, but basically three. Yeah. And they only bring you out if you're not performing. You can destroy trust by not being honest of something that's crash landing, of you made a deal and the founders aren't working out, et cetera. So we try to be transparent. Something that I've said in a variety of our LP discussions in terms of like, if I could give advice to LPs is, I don't think they ask enough questions about peer group hmm. and kind of our reputation. So, mm -hmm. you know, I like to think that a LP that's diligencing VSC or union they should find out like what our reputation is with our peer fund. So I always think about what are folks saying about me? Like, what's my voice in the locker room? Am I doing the work? Like, you know, at, at the combine, it's not only like how many times I bench 235, it's like my 40, but they're also interviewing like, how was he as a teammate? Yeah. And so I feel like that's something they don't ask enough because if you ask Peter Boyce from Stellation, what are five managers that he thinks are going to be successful? I would imagine his hit rate's gonna be quite high. Yeah. And one of the things that we, you and I had talked about this for operator, my mental model going into the operator cohort with you and others was like, I just want to be known as a top three best fund in the cohort and one of the most collaborative, yes. competitive people out there. And that way, that's the most important goal is that people know who you are and say, hey, if you're looking for deep tech, go to Union. We'll, uh, we'll leave on, on a hopeful note like we do with, with a lot of our, our guests, um, hopefully. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about climate uh, on the show. I mean, the, the broader conversation that we have on the show is about building and scaling uh, climate innovation companies. And we've certainly talked a lot about sales and scaling sales today. When we look a little bit sort of bigger picture, a lot of doom and gloom out there about lack of action when it comes to climate. We're obviously at the kind of forefront investing in those companies that are 
going to make a difference. What is one thing that keeps you hopeful about this broader fight against climate change? Yeah, I. you know, it's funny because how you look at things from a mental model or a time scale, it affects your opinion. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what I see in the climate conversation now is one year, two year, three year, right? And so that can get you really pessimistic about where things are going. But as an operator who basically had a startup in climate in 2008 to 2010, I can now see the long view and say, wow, there was a time when I was driving in the Silicon Valley prior to Tesla, there was like two Honda EVs mm -hmm. and you'd see them on the Lawrence Expressway. Now I pull into a parking lot, I see no fewer than 10 Teslas. So we're now, this is like, everybody will have an electric vehicle in the US, I don't know, within five, 10 years. That's amazing, yeah. right? And so I think the time scale is important to understand, right, why things are working. And so if we think of just climate doing the right thing, generally people know what, how to do the right thing. We know we need to exercise. We know we need to get our sleep, et cetera. People choose not to do it, fine. Like, you know, I shouldn't be drinking sugar, but I love Coke, right? <laughs> it's fine. I think what is where I spend time on climate, climate startups that solve a meaningful problem in business or enterprise and that do so without a green premium. Yeah. So meaning like if you're choosing between option A and option B, not only do you get the same solution, but you get something that has a positive climate impact and it's at the same price or at a negative discount, that's going to win. Yeah. Where I don't spend any time at any mind share is I'm not trying to influence people to pay 2x for stuff mm -hmm. that needs a green premium to be successful. Yeah. Because like I don't think in ultimately that's sustainable. And yeah. that was the mistake in climate one because a majority of the companies were boosted by government subsidies and that's not sustainable. Yeah. So and, these yeah. businesses have to thrive on their own. And, and you're feeling optimistic that there are more of these companies today that thrive on their own than, than perhaps did in yeah. the last go around. And you mentioned it. I mean, a, a proxy for that is how do I feel about the climate investors that are pure climate investors? So when I see folks like from Earthshot Ventures, yeah. or I see Stonely and Third Sphere, I see Sophie's new fund, yep. right? I see Chris Saka, who's been an OG of seed investing in lower carbon. I mean, have I, I mean, they take so many bold bets. I feel really positive that there's very smart, inspired people that are deploying capital to the right entrepreneurs. So I think over time, we're going to see it. That's great, man. Well, that's a wonderful place to leave this conversation. Nate, I am so grateful for the, the far-reaching conversation that we had. Yeah. I know we, we started talking about building, growing, scaling sales, customer discovery, customer validation, but uh, then got into a little bit of, of how we build the fund. So uh, all in all, um, super grateful for you joining me on the show today. And hoping we'll get to do this again uh, sometime soon. Next Let's time do it again. Out. Come visit us in San Francisco. And for anybody out there listening, we'd uh, love to get in touch with you. We're unionlabs.com or at unionlabs on Twitter. Perfect. Well, that's it for this week's episode of Climb by VSC. Thank you so much for watching and listening. My thanks to Nate Williams from Union Labs for joining us for this awesome conversation. You know that you can watch as well as listen to episodes of Climb? Head on over to YouTube and you can check out our beautiful faces in 4K. Uh, in the meantime, I just want to thank you all for listening on all your favorite platforms. If you like this episode, leave us a five-star review. If you love this episode, recommend a guest to us that we'd love to have on Climb. Well, that's it for now. Thank you so much for watching Climb by VSC.